Hey everyone, this is Alicia Krause back here at the PragerU HQ, which is under transition right now. We're in the process of moving from one office to another, hence the reason there's this weird white wall behind me. But I know that you are tuning in to hear our friend and expert, Lisa Deftari. She's the editor-in-chief of TheForeignDesk.com. You've also probably seen her on television quite a few times or heard her on radio. Lisa is an expert when it comes to terrorism, or specifically a counterterrorism expert in the Middle East, and she's here to talk to us today about the latest terror attacks in Manchester, London, and Paris. Lisa, thank you so much for making time for us today. Of course. Great to be back with you guys. Really appreciate it. And of course, if anyone wants to tune in and be able to hear from you every single day. You have a really awesome email that I have signed up for. It's called the Daily Dispatch, and it's a kind of top 10 world news roundup focusing on national security issues for us here in America and foreign affairs. People should definitely check that out as well. Um, so when we booked this, we planned to talk about the recent attacks on Saturday in London and had no idea this that we'd be waking up this morning to unfortunately talk about attack at Notre Dame. Um, in Paris on, on police forces there by a man that the French security forces have now said was an Algerian citizen. Uh, and I think that he was a student in Paris and he was shouting this is for Syria as he attacked a, two police officers with a hammer before he was shot in the chest. He is alive, so I'm sure that they will be interrogating him soon to see where his ideas came from, where his ideology came from, where his reasoning or purpose for this attack came from. He apparently also had kitchen knives on him, so he wanted to do much more damage than with just a hammer. Um, what are your thoughts on this most recent attack? Uh, this is going to be what we're going to be seeing going forward more and more and more. We're seeing, obviously, more incidents unfold in Europe, but uh, this just points to this uh, evolution in ISIS. Uh, and other uh, terror groups that basically follow in ISIS's footsteps when, in which they've created this post uh, bin Laden type of terrorism. It's a do-it-yourself jihadi 101 where in your own home, within your own possessions, you find weapons that are everyday weapons. You don't need a sophisticated bomb. You don't need to be in Syria or Iraq to get any kind of training, uh, but you can launch local attacks in small scale that do as much damage um, meaning for ISIS's name to get out to have another uh, type of, 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 of attack to have one casualty or five or ten, um, you have done your job and if you die in the process it's even better because you're a shaheed, you're a martyr and it's exactly what we've seen if we start connecting the dots in Manchester, in London mm -hmm. and, and uh, more recently this morning. So I've been hearing a lot from Fox News to MSNBC to CNN that there is probably going to be an unfortunate increase in attacks during Ramadan. Why is right. that? You know, it's funny because everyone talks about an increase in attacks during Ramadan, but uh, traditionally it was just the opposite. Hmm. Uh, other terror groups and other rogue regimes always had a ceasefire, at least some some point of, of, of or type of clemency during the month of Ramadan. Whenever I had human rights cases within Saudi Arabia or Iran, that was the time to push them in front of those courts because that's when you would see the most uh, c compassion coming from those rogue, rogue regimes. Same mm -hmm. thing with uh, terror attacks or activity within Syria. Right now, again, ISIS, new face of terrorism, new type of terrorism that has zero, um, you know, there's no, there is no, nothing is sacred. You go after children, you go after women, you saw the, the Manchester attack, young girls, nothing is sacred. Uh, and now you see during the month of Ramadan and you ask why, well, everyone's guards are down, literally and figuratively. You know, you have people who are off duty in terms of their, their uh, police forces, you saw this in Iraq. Um, the young people and young families out at an ice, ice cream parlor and there was an attack there. Uh, and then you see during the month of Ramadan that ISIS has actually called for an increase in attacks uh, during this time because they want to basically, uh, you know, have have this time period to say Ramadan is a period of war because mm -hmm. we're doing it for the holy cause. For people who, who want to differentiate between the, the ISIS actually following the religion of Islam and not, you know, I follow ISIS on, on the web on a daily basis. And it's amazing to see that between 12 and 2 Eastern, which would be the time of Iftar uh, in the Caliphate or in the region, mm -hmm. you see them okay. basically be very, very inactive online. It's going to show that they're celebrating the holiday, they're actually partaking in the holiday and the festivities uh, and breaking their fast at, at night. So it's an interesting time period to watch all these attacks 
um, and, and to watch the directive coming from the, the caliphate, which also takes us into the, the, the discussion or the debate over inspired attacks versus it, it directed attacks from the caliphate, from, from ISIS itself. So I guess that's one of the questions that uh, arose over the weekend that some security forces are asking is these gentlemen, or I hate to even use the word gentlemen, but these terrorists in London, there were three of them in that van and then some, you know, that participated overall in the attack uh, on the London Bridge and then in a market nearby. And so obviously there had to be some planning or orchestration. At what point do you think that the security forces will find out or do you think that they already know whether or not they got this directive from someone in the Middle East, like potentially Syria uh, or Raqqa even, you know, giving this directive of, of what to do? Right. So they, they rounded up 12 individuals in the aftermath, meaning, you know, th this is a, a terror cell, really. Uh, well, and all, all, the, all 12 of those individuals, according to CNN International and BBC yesterday, were released were released, right. Mm -hmm. Within those 12, there was women, older people, younger people, between the ages of 19 and 60. So when you think about it, even though they were released, and and, and it's, it's interesting to see, uh, you know, whether or not in the future we're going to say that there's any correlation or any, if you connect the dots between, there has been in the past, different attacks within Europe where you have seen uh, cross collaboration over over you know borders over mm -hmm. between countries between individuals between families um, women involved and the whole entire family involved so whether or not there was a, a direct uh, communications that points to you know when we ask the question what can we do when you look at a directive a, a direct um, order from mm -hmm. from the cafe, from headquarters in order to carry out an attack. You think, well, we haven't, if we haven't been able to get them offline, which is a very daunting task, right? So even if Twitter takes down a quarter million accounts, you know, millions more come back, like sprout up like weeds, because that's what they do. They're dedicated to this full time. You look at that direct communication, which we have not been able to break. If there is a directive, if there is that direct, you know, people within the caliphate able to reach these individuals and able to, and, and, and law enforcement not able to intercept these messages, that's where we need to look more closely within this country, within Europe, and say that's where our intel, what, whatever we gain. And for example, you have those videos on YouTube, which these individuals who, who carried out the London attack were inspired by mm -hmm. to carry out a ramming and knife attack within some time period. Now, they decided to launch this attack during the month of Ramadan, again, something that ISIS has been pushing. But law enforcement, they, these individuals came under their radar at different time periods, but specifically for watching this YouTube video and specifically for being inspired to do a ramming and knife attack. This really speaks to very specific intel, very specific, uh, you know, looking at these, these individuals and their activities and being able to move in faster rather than sitting back and allowing these events to unfold. So one of the things that I consistently think about, I lived in New York City for seven years in, in a post 9-11 world. Obviously, we're in Los Angeles now. It's the second largest media market in the country. It's the home of Western culture, which you know ISIS deems to hate, much like Al Qaeda did. So what's preventing these sorts of attacks you know, right in our own backyard? I think we, we obviously have a very, very sophisticated level of intelligence and cyber intelligence. I think the U.S. has been very, very um, keen on, on stopping these types of attacks and, and activities. And, um, you know, like yourself, I, I, you know, lived in New York City um, for, for many, many years. And I remember, um, you know, so many attacks that were foiled that, you know, the, the, the public doesn't hear about uh, and some that we do hear about. But regardless, I think an attack like, you know, let me back up and say, an event, an incident, like the car that basically mounted the sidewalk a couple weeks ago in Times Square, for example, that was not a terror, or directly a terror attack. He had other grievances and other, you know, mental instabilities that, that are talked about. But what it did point to was that vulnerability in someone being able to still have a, do that type of attack in Times Square, which has always been looked at as one of the main targets mm -hmm. uh, should, uh, you know, God forbid, an, a terror uh, attack be launched in, in one of these open public spaces. Um, you know, I think for a very long time, more specifically since 2014, when the caliphate was launched, um, U.S. law enforcement, both local and federal, 
have been very much focused on breaking these cells, especially within larger cities, and being able to safeguard these, um, so to speak, soft targets. I attended a cousin's graduation a couple of weeks ago in Los Angeles, and I had to walk through three sets of metal detectors for an outdoor uh, ceremony, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit, you know, scary that this, these are the times that we're living in, but also makes you feel great that this is these are the, the safeguards that have been put in place in the aftermath of all these different incidents taking place. Speaking of those safeguards, what do you think that the United States and our allies, you know, most of Western Europe can do during this time when we know that these type of low-level attacks are going to be uh, attempted by lovers of ISIS? What, so what yeah, do we def do to defend ourselves and defend our citizens? Yeah, I think two things that definitely come to mind is shared intelligence. I think mm -hmm. some of the, um, the, the, the most, you know, simple of, of uh, kind of warnings and threats have been overlooked and missed uh, because there's been this, this lack of, of sharing of intelligence. I think one of the reasons that Brexit actually took place, like the straw that, you know, the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back in, in terms of Brexit was this, you know, failure on the part of the EU and that community to look at this as a, as a terror, as a, as a serious threat and to share intelligence across borders to truly stop this whether it's weapons take being taken across borders or individuals going across borders in Europe. And I think the UK had enough of it. And now look at what's going on in the UK uh, in terms of all these terror attacks. I think we truly need to, across the pond, across borders, look at how we can better collaborate to stop this as a global threat. I think, you know, Donald Trump going over to the region was a great way to kind of start this symbolic um, sharing of intelligence now, are, you know, the Arab countries divorcing with Qatar, another great symbolic breaking with that world and really uniting this world, meaning the terror and the, the pro-terror and the anti-terror world right now, uh, and, and, and truly going, going forward and having a, a, a more robust community and society and, and intel world to rely on and going after this threat. Can you, I've been following the story, but if you mentioned a, a kind of divestment from Qatar and relationships there, I know that Saudi Arabia and a few other nations have been leading the way. Can you explain to our audience what's happening? Yeah, basically, to put it in the most simple of terms, Qatar has been the terrorist piggy bank for a very, very, very long time. They have basically whitewashed a lot of the money that has been funneled in. Uh, two terror organizations being able to give it back to those terror organizations, funding a lot of these terror activities. And I think that symbolically, whether it was Donald Trump's trip to, the, to Saudi Arabia, or, or I should say more likely that this shift in the Middle East has been, has been going on for a very long time. When you see countries like Saudi Arabia and Egypt aligning themselves more with some, a country like Israel, mm -hmm because of this war on terror and basically turning their backs on more rogue regimes and pro-terror regimes like Qatar. And a lot of people will say, well, you know, Egypt and Saudi Arabia are not innocent. They have their hands in a lot of this activity. Yes, that is true. But we're in a post-ally world in terms of foreign policy and we're actually entering or have been entering this more interest-aligned foreign policy. And that means that countries like Saudi Arabia and uh, Jordan and Morocco and um, Israel can have this unity because they want to keep terror off their borders and out of their country. And I think that this really points to the, the more symbolic or the more tangible changes that we're seeing in the region. So you mentioned going to a graduation, obviously that would be considered a soft target. Um, you know, Cars 3 is coming out. My almost four-year-old wants to see it with her Nana and Papa in a couple of weeks. Would you recommend that Americans just be wary of going to places like malls and theaters that might be soft targets, or should they just can keep living life as usual? This is such a tough question. It, it truly is such a tough question because the American patriot in me says, we can't let them win. Mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't stop our lives. Um, but the realist in me says you have a you have a four year old child and it's your responsibility and mine to keep that child and every other child safe and to keep our, our families safe. And I think that this is an important note uh, to really emphasize when it comes to the current state of American politics. Left, right, and center, we have to come together to say that we need, we need terror out of our borders, whether these individuals are already here, whether they're coming in from, from within our borders. We have to keep America safe. 
It's not, it's not policy, it's not a political party, this is reality. And unfortunately, I don't want to tell you not to take your child to the mall or to the promenade or to Times Square. It's that you should have that, we should all acknowledge that this is the current threat and we need to do everything in our, in our power to temporarily at least be cognizant of this threat and to really put the pressure on local and federal law enforcement all the way up to legislative measures that will um, really keep national security at the forefront. And we're seeing this from our current administration, thankfully. Uh, and hopefully we'll see a, a change and, and we can start seeing real changes in, in terms of, of, of stopping this threat. So final question, um, do you think that those changes specifically on the national and the legislative level, though, are going to potentially infringe on any constitutional liberties of, of Americans? We, we saw this in the aftermath of 9-11. Patriot Act. And, it, and in the Patriot Act, uh, in, in even local law enforcement. You know, I, obviously, I, I come from a Middle Eastern family, and I remember my brothers always getting stopped at the airport, even getting stopped by, you know, local uh, police getting pulled over all the time. And, you know, it, it didn't bother them at the time because they knew that it was temporary and for the good of the people meaning if there is some sort of threat if people who you know fit that profile look like them then they should be stopped and they should be questioned now that always comes with in, in the keeping the greater you know good as the priority and wanting to keep American safe is the priority, will always infringe upon our rights some, somewhat. But I think that the main goal is to keep intact the Constitution as much as possible, to keep our rights intact as much as possible, and to work from that point of view or that perspective, to work then to build uh, those safeguards around this fence of, of the Constitution and our rights. As, as difficult as that is, I think, look, in, if we want to kind of talk real talk, uh, in the aftermath of 9-11, I think many of us were on board with the Patriot Act, with, you know, profiling, with, you know, long lines at the airports. Because we knew always 2020. <laughs> absolutely. As we kind of departed from that, we forgot about 9-11. 9-11 became like, what? We're safe. We're... And we became ignorant. We truly became ignorant until we started seeing it again. And in this country, if you talk to so many individuals, they still don't believe that we have had terror attacks since 9-11. They don't see Orlando or any of the, or San Bernardino or any of the other attacks which have been small and medium and large scale since then as attacks. They don't look at Europe and think that that could happen to us next, and it will happen to us next because people have kitchen knives and people have cars and you know life goes on in this country. So I think that looking back, we don't want another 9-11 scale attack, but we also don't want these knife attacks and these local attacks to happen here. So I think we have to be patient and we have to remember that national security is not a partisan issue as much as it's always been made one, uh, especially in more recent times, and that we don't want what's happening. They said what happens in Israel is going to happen all around the world. It went from Israel to Europe, and unfortunately, we're going to see more of it in the West, but we hope not. Well, Lisa, we appreciate your time and your expertise today. Be sure to follow Lisa on Twitter and on Facebook. It's just her name, Lisa Deftari, which you can copy and paste. It's also When in Doubt, Sound it Out. We appreciate your time today. And just a reminder for everyone, these PragerU Lives are free, much like all of our videos are free because of generous donations from normal people like you and me. So please click the link and be willing to donate. Even $5 helps get our message about Western civilization and the beauty of our freedoms and liberties here in the United States that are applicable to people all around the world. Thank you so much for tuning into this PragerU Live, and we'll see you soon.